ready to get started? Sure. Great. So uh, it's a pleasure to introduce Stacy Loeb, who I, I'm sure we all know. Uh, Stacy got her MD from Northwestern, then trained at Johns Hopkins. Uh, recently, just was awarded the Gold Cystoscope this year. So uh, it's a pleasure for us to hear her speak today. I, I believe about social media, correct? I think you may be muted, Stacy. Sorry, it's uh, digital technology, yeah. so including. <laughs> social media, web, apps, and telemedicine. Sam, fantastic. And I've got a note, um, Stacy's nomination and uh, election as Gold Cystoscope Award winner this year. Often that's a very political process. I got to say the, the nationwide support for Stacy was remarkable for all of her work in supporting prostate cancer surveillance, use of active uh, surveillance and testing uh, for prostate cancer. So congrats, Stacy. It's really well deserved. Oh, thank you so much. Um, okay, so I guess I'll go ahead and share my screen. Can you guys see the screen okay? Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, so <clears throat> we're going to talk about the promise and the peril of digital technology in urology. This is important because the majority of health consumers do go online for information, and many go online also to find other people who share the same health concerns. So not only is it a one-way flow of information, but more and more people are involved in the social aspect of this as well. Social media use in general is on the rise in our country, with the top three platforms being YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. Health apps are also increasing in use, as shown in this graph. About one-fifth of the U.S. population is currently using a health app, so another very big population. So let's just start first with online networks many potential benefits for healthcare providers specifically. And these include advertising, maybe even more so now during the pandemic where um, more traditional venues of hearing about our institutions and departments may uh, not exist. Also important for clinical care, medical education, professional networking and research. This is a study that we did a few years ago. I think I conceived this actually trying to prove to my boss that Twitter was important and impactful. <laughs> but um, we showed that urology departments that had more Twitter followers and tweets had a significantly higher US news reputation score. Now this is a correlation, so I can't say that there's a cause and effect relationship, and it could be even reverse causality. It could be that uh, departments that are m more famous just had more followers. Um, but it seems, you know, self-explanatory that if you publicize the good things that are going on in your department um, and all the great things that people do, that it could only help the reputation score. Uh, this even came to a head more this year with all the virtual uh, residency applications and there was a lot of use by uh, social media by applicants. So there's even dedicated accounts and lists for applicants showing all the different urology programs that it was really widely used. So I think it took on a whole new role during the pandemic. In terms of clinical care, there's a lot of clinical discussions happening on social media. Um, Jeremy Teo and colleagues introduced the Eurosomi hashtag in 2018. That stands for Urology Social Media, and they've had a lot of discussions on there between different urologists. They've even had live case discussions um, discussing specific cases but also just general conversation among the urology community and this has led to successful research collaborations. 
this is just some examples of crowdsourcing cases. Um, so on the left, you can see one from Twitter where Eric Klein was asking colleagues about a case of a man with, um, you know, elevated, well, I guess not really elevated PSA, but a suspicious MRI and what would people do? And you can see that, you know, in a day, he got 339 responses to this question. And it was, you know, kind of interesting to see where a large number of colleagues would go. So instead of calling your one mentor on the phone and asking what they would do under this specific circumstance, it's pretty neat to be able to find out, you know, what hundreds of colleagues from around the world would do in a specific scenario. You know, we don't know who the people are that responded to this or anything, but it certainly provides some insight. And, and there was definitely a clear leader. Um, on the right is an Instagram post showing a pathology slide. There's a lot more case discussions going on on more visual platforms for specialties like radiology and pathology where there's a lot of visual content. Um, social networks can also be used for clinical guidelines dissemination. Um, this is a project that I worked on with the EAU where our group of about four uh, urologists was tasked with converting all of the EAU guidelines into social media posts. This was starting in uh, like 2014. So first we started with Twitter, Facebook and LinkedIn. This just shows the dissemination on Twitter during about the first 18 months of the lease. And these guidelines posts reach more than 9 million people just on the one platform. So it was a nice way to share the guidelines and led to a lot of link visits to the full guidelines page. So we hope that this helps to um, promote wider use of evidence-based management. Social media have also become an important learning tool for medical education. This paper about young urologists in Europe found that video content on YouTube was ranked as the preferred tool to learn about surgical technique. And I think uh, the use of these online networks for education has really expanded greatly during the pandemic with the Empire Lecture Series and many other online educational opportunities. So this is really nice because now we have a nice repository of a lot of really good content and uh, many more people were able to join in. <coughs> Another opportunity is to conduct journal clubs in more of a global format. So uh, journal clubs have been around for hundreds of years and typically meet in person with a small group of local people, uh, like in the case of our urology journal club up until the pandemic, it was held, you know, in a room at the Manhattan VA, and it was just our department of urology. We did not have participation from other departments or other institutions. But, you know, why not? Why couldn't you do this online and have a journal club with the whole world and have lots of multidisciplinary stakeholders discussing their perspective on the articles? So in 2017, I started the Prostate Cancer Journal Club on Twitter together with the Prostate Cancer Foundation. Um, it's still hosted roughly once a month on Twitter. Uh, over a 48 hour period to account for different time zones of participants. And we've had a really good response. Uh, and, you know, even more so than people actively posting to it, many more people read the post. So it's been a nice way to share important new research in prostate cancer. And the participants have been from multiple countries, more than 15 different countries different medical specialties, and also about a third of people not in medicine. So it's a nice way to allow patients and other stakeholders to participate in research discussions. And if you 
I think that sounds interesting. Good news. We do have Prostate Cancer Journal Club starting today. Uh, this is the article that we'll be discussing for the next couple of days. So if anybody would like to join the discussion of this paper, really quite a fascinating paper. Um, you can go to the hashtag ProstateJC on Twitter sometime in, uh, between now and Wednesday, and we'll have the authors of the paper and a series of discussion questions, and you're welcome to join in if you have any comments or just uh, follow along to see what the authors have to say about this um, quite provocative paper. Social networks are also great for professional networking among clinicians. These are just a few groups that I actively follow and enjoy a lot. The Women Docs and Urology group on Facebook, the AUA has a urology place, which is a forum, um, but there's many opportunities to meet new colleagues online. Um, and, you know, uh, it seems that people do find these networks helpful. Uh, Cora is asking, what is the site? So for the Prostate Journal Club, it is just on Twitter. Um, so the PCF account hosts the, club, the journal club. Um, it's um, at PCF Science. So if you follow them, you'll see the tweets. Or you can just search for the hashtag ProstateJC and uh, you'll see the string of the discussion. So either way. Um, and, you know, it'll probably continuously happen between now and Wednesday. So um, I'd say just keep checking back to that hashtag uh, throughout the week. Um, so this is a survey that we did of participants in um, social media feed during the 2014 EAU and AUA meetings, wherein the majority of users do perceive that um, social media was helpful for numerous professional goals. So um, maybe the people who don't think so weren't using it and that's why they weren't in this survey, but I think it's pretty clear that it helps with networking, information, dissemination, research, and I'm gonna show you some examples that we're doing. Uh, here is a recent um, publication um, using social media for research. Actually, this just came out a couple of days ago, so hot off the press. <laughs> um, but we wanted to see the patient and caregiver perspective from prostate cancer patients and their families on what impact COVID-19 has had for them. So we use data from two different online health communities and we um, search for all of the posts that mention coronavirus, COVID-19, pandemic, or any kind of related keywords to see what were the patients and their families talking about. And uh, really their concerns were far reaching. There is a lot of worry about the impact of COVID-19 on prostate cancer care. People were having trouble getting prescriptions, testing, treatments were getting delayed. Um, some of their physicians had been redeployed for COVID care and couldn't be reached or weren't available to see them. There was uh, slowdowns in research and interruptions in clinical trials. It also um, was more difficult for their coping capacity to deal with uh, their cancer in the midst of everything else that was going on. Um, but then conversely, they also had a lot of concerns about the impact of prostate cancer on COVID-19. So there's a lot of questions over the impact of prostate cancer on the risk of getting COVID, and also concerns that if they have a diagnosis of cancer, that maybe they would not be given a ventilator um, if there became shortages um, with many people hospitalized. Um, and then interestingly, these health communities about prostate cancer were also just discussing COVID itself and asking each other questions about it, sharing articles and making comments. There was a little bit of misinformation, 7% about COVID that we found in these posts, just um, inaccurate comments about masks or 
the danger of COVID compared to the flu. Um, so that's just an example of a research study using social media data. Um, there are some cons of social media and digital media for healthcare providers, uh, which uh, include overuse, disciplinary action, and harassment. This <laughs> was a kind of a funny article that was in the Washington Post, but you know, I thought, oh God, you know, I'm probably going to be like bent over in 30 years if I don't stop looking down at my phone all the time. So I think we definitely have to be mindful of the ergonomics and, you know, make sure that we don't get text neck. Um, there can be negative professional repercussions and disciplinary action. This case was actually from Cornell, uh, where an ER nurse posted to Instagram a picture of this ER bay after a man was hit by the sixth train, um, and this post led to termination. Uh, this nurse actually took this experience and eventually, you know, shaped this into a positive career path and runs a podcast about how to recover from mistakes and gives a lot of talks around the world about, um, you know, how to use social media. But if this is just an example of how you have to just be careful um, posting any kind of content with pictures inside the hospital or discussing a specific patient case. Um, concerningly is this paper that came out last week. This is discussing harassment of physicians on social media. This was in JAMA Internal Medicine. Um, these are different kinds of physicians from across the US and 23% reported being personally attacked. Women were more likely than men to report online sexual harassment. So, um, you know, as, as nice as they are to connect with people and meet people, there is also the potential for negative interaction. This, in urology specifically, this is a survey that we did recently um, looking at drawbacks of social media use for urologists we found that not very many met criteria for social media addiction, but about 17% had had negative consequences or harassment. Um, and not everybody thought that it helped the doctor-patient relationship. So moving on to health consumers. Uh, so online networks do have some very important benefits for health consumers. They can help with awareness and education, support networks, and even fundraising. Um, so if you look at um, Instagram, Facebook, any of these networks, there's a lot of great awareness messages. And some of these are quite striking, uh, like this graphic about um, your penis saying you should stop smoking from Instagram. I think this is very attention getting. and you know, could help to raise awareness of the link between smoking with ED, for example. Um, a lot of good medical research is shared on social networks. This is another nice example from Instagram showing about all the evidence between dairy and an increased risk of prostate cancer. And so you can have a nice graphic that, you know, catches the attention, but then you can see that the text gives a lot of the research data behind this. And it has been shown empirically that YouTube is an effective way to provide patient education. This was an excellent study called hashtag Post Baby Hanky Panky, in which they developed five YouTube videos about sexual concerns among these parents. These videos had more than 90,000 views in 14 countries. The investigators found that watching the videos was associated with significantly greater confidence, coping with sexual issues, and discussing them with partners. Wow, that was so cool. That was from my SMSNA talk, and I thought, well, I should throw that in, and it still has a presentation. <laughs> uh, so, um, also, there's a lot of support available for patients and online networks. So, these are just like a few different examples of 
closed groups on Facebook uh, that people can join with erectile dysfunction, newly diagnosed prostate cancer. So especially nowadays where, you know, local support groups are not meeting or, you know, maybe you would just rather go to one that's virtual with people who are not in your area or there's not enough people who are like you that have a group in your area that you can go to one of these groups and you can see it's closed. So you have to actually answer the screening questions and become a member to be able to see the posts in these groups. Um, and then, as I mentioned, it's also being used for fundraising. So this is a study that we did looking at crowdfunding that is going on between patients with different kinds of cancer um, and is primarily being used to help offset treatment costs because of all of the financial toxicity of cancer care. Um, so can be useful for health consumers as a source of information, even a source of funding, um, but there's definitely a lot of downsides to online information, including um, poor readability, for a lot of the information that's at uh, too high a reading level or is not readily actionable for health consumers. There is also a lot of bias and misinformation that is circulating, as well as concerns about equity. So uh, this is a study that just came out in urology practice. It was looking at male infertility websites. There's many such studies, but I just this was a recent one, and I thought that this is a good example. Um, and, you know, they used the discern criteria, which is a validated criteria for assessing the quality of consumer health information. And only 12% were good quality, and 7% met JAMA benchmark criteria. Um, also, the reading level was difficult. So, this is pretty consistent if you look at a lot of uh, web websites for a lot of different urologic conditions. So this would probably be a very similar finding um, across the board. Um, another concern is just uh, difficulty in discerning underlying conflicts of interest when you're looking at online information. So this study was in JAMA Internal Medicine a few years back looking at um, Twitter posts by uh, hematology oncology professionals, and they found that um, many of them are discussing health-related topics, not surprisingly, and, you know, a good number of their posts mention commercial products or services, but uh, it's rare that you see any conflict of interest disclosed in social media posts or profiles. And this isn't something that's necessarily intentional or trying to be nefarious. There's really like no room in somebody's Twitter bio to give a list of their conflicts of interest. And in a short post, it's not likely that you would include this information, but it is something that is worth considering. You know, maybe in the future, there should just be one online site where people update their conflicts of interest instead of doing it separately for every journal article and everything you do. Um, because otherwise, you know, it's just really unclear whether somebody has a relationship to the material. Um, another concern is just frank misinformation, which does seem to be pretty widespread. This is a review article that we published about spread of misinformation about urologic conditions on social media. And we found examples in urologic oncology, female pelvic medicine, endourology, sexual medicine, and infertility. So it's, it is definitely out there. Um, some of our studies have been specifically focused on YouTube since it is the most commonly used social media platform in the United States. This is a recent one, it just came out. I think it's like the article of the month for European urology, where we looked at the first 150 YouTube videos about bladder cancer. 
Um, 67% were moderate to poor quality of information using that same discern criteria that I mentioned before. Um, and 21% had a moderate to high level of misinformation. So it's concerning when you think of the wide reach that this has and just how many people are seeing the misinformation on these big platforms and with nobody really to police the information. Um, this was our original study on this topic, which was looking at the top 150 YouTube videos about prostate cancer, showing that 77% had poor quality, potentially misinformative and or biased content with a total of more than 6 million views. And concerningly, the worst quality videos had more views and more thumbs up. So uh, it seems that health consumers were not able to discern the good information from the bad because the bad ones were actually more popular than the good ones. So just saying, oh, but you know, this was such a widely viewed video or so many people liked this doesn't mean that it's good. So what can we do about this? This has been um, a big area of our research over the past couple of years. I've been teamed up with a group of computer scientists who develop machine learning algorithms to identify fake news in political and celebrity news. And they've been helping me to design algorithms to detect uh, fake news about prostate cancer in online content. So uh, we work on training the algorithm um, and using multimodal features. So in this particular case, this is the publication of our preliminary model based on um, just 250 prostate cancer videos. Really not a lot of annotated content to, to um, create a good algorithm. But if you combine the metadata of the video, as well as the linguistic and acoustic features, the combined model with these multimodal features had 74% accuracy for identifying misinformative prostate cancer videos. So um, the hope is that by training a much larger data set that we could um, improve upon the accuracy of the model uh, with the future goal of creating a smarter search filter or helping to um, change the algorithm to push down information that's likely to be misinformative uh, moving on to um, other types of digital health. So telemedicine has been a very big topic recently. Um, this is a systematic review of the literature about telemedicine in urology. Uh, they identified 45 studies and found that it has been successfully implemented for a number of different types of urological uh, visits. That includes upfront management decisions, follow-up care, as well as survivorship care, such as um, pelvic floor exercises for um, a variety of urological conditions. And they felt that the boost and increased use during COVID-19 could help add a lot more data to this. Um, and indeed, it has been increasing a lot during COVID-19. This is a survey that we did recently on telemedicine use among urologists during the pandemic. Um, 676 urologists from around the world answered this uh, survey and um, it increased from 16% who were using telemedicine before COVID to 46% during the pandemic um, from all different countries around the world. So I think it's uh, certainly, it's definitely increased quite a lot. Um, this is a study that just came out from the University of Michigan comparing like a matched analysis of uh, 500 established patients, video visits versus in-person visits. And they showed um, similar completion rates, but a, a much shorter cycle time, time from entry to completion with the telemedicine, not surprisingly, because somebody's not 
you know, sitting in the waiting room and, and all this stuff. Um, there was no difference in reimbursement thanks to uh, recent legislation, but they did find more visits that were telemedicine were billed as level three. I guess we'll see how this all pans out with the latest um, changes to E&M coding. Um, another downstream consequence of telemedicine that perhaps has gotten less attention, but um, I think should get more attention is the opportunity to have a positive environmental impact. So this was what I thought was a very interesting study using life cycle analysis to look at the impact of telemedicine versus usual care for a couple of clinical units in Sweden. And they found that replacing the physical visits with telemedicine resulted in a pretty substantial decrease in carbon emissions. So um, not only do we see some benefits in terms of increased efficiency and shorter cycle time in the clinic, but we're also getting um, less carbon emissions from having people driving long distances to see us. Um, but this is not perfect. Um, so this was, you know, very thoughtful editorial from um, Watts and Abraham up at Montefiore. Um, called virtually perfect for some, but perhaps not for all. And they discussed some of the challenges and concerns about equity and potentially in even increasing health disparities since um, there are certain groups of people, such as senior citizens, non-white individuals, and people who are below the poverty line who are less likely to have broadband um, they also discussed difficulties with integration of translation services. Um, I've had like one phone with the translator on speakerphone sitting next to my other phone with the telemedicine visit. And it, it, I agree, it, it is definitely not seamless in the current format and can be hard for somebody to hear the translator. So I think we will have to, you know, try to work through these challenges in implementation. Um, APPS is another really burgeoning area. This is a review article um, discussing all the different current types and use of urology APPS. The authors identified 172 APPS about uh, kidney, bladder, prostate, testicular andrology and urology in the Apple and Google Play Store. About half and half were for patients or doctors. Uh, some of them were education, some were practice tools, there's diaries, diet, exercises, and communities. So lots of different possible functions. I think there's a lot of exciting stuff to work on here. And you know, just to illustrate a few examples of how they can be used in different ways. So this had just come out in urology practice, and I thought it was an interesting article where um, these were uh, patients who were new referrals for lower urinary tract symptoms, and before the patient would come in or even get scheduled, they had them complete validated questionnaires and a bladder diary through a mobile app, and they used those responses to actually triage the visits. So some people were given appointments sooner based on what they entered um, versus a routine office visit versus a remote visit. So um, it is possible to use apps in conjunction with clinical care or even as an aid to try to triage who has more severe symptoms or who's more likely to have a problem that would require them to come to the office um, and who doesn't. Um, or apps can be used, um, for example, to promote survivorship care. So this is a nice example from your department, uh, looking at um, user-friendly collection of patient-reported outcomes. This is for patients who have had robotic prostatectomy. They get push notifications to perform physical activity. This has a tracker integration to see how much activity they're doing as well as educational materials. So since most of us, you know, have our phone with us constantly, 
many people don't even go to the bathroom without it. I think we have a great opportunity to engage with our patients and to uh, leverage mobile applications to help provide more comprehensive survivorship care. So I thought this was really cool. Um, and apps can also be used in um, our medical education. So this is a global survey of urology trainees and the vast majority use guideline apps for educational purposes and feel that they're important in their education. And I can say definitely I see this to be the case. I, do, I cover the resident clinic at the VA and um, they're often using apps to you know, look up uh, how often somebody needs imaging after treatment and things like that. So I think that uh, they could be very helpful, not only for uh, health consumers, but also for um, clinicians and trainees. So um, I'll uh, end with um, the discussion of some of our current projects in the digital health space. We have a few things going on with both um, apps and with social media. Um, so one topic that we're very interested in is health disparities in prostate cancer. Um, as many of you know, black men are disproportionately affected by prostate cancer um, and are underrepresented in clinical trials. This is a study that I published with Hal Borno from UCSF looking at videos on YouTube about prostate cancer clinical trials. And in these 150 videos, there were a total of 292 people, but only 4% were perceived as black by a consensus panel of multiple viewers. So um, this led us to um, proposing this grant project, um, which we're currently in the midst of. We have a DOD Health Disparity Research Award looking at the impact of online information on health disparities. So we're very interested to see um, how important uh, is um, diversity and inclusion in the online space and um, what impact racial concordance has for health information online in terms of trust in the information and clinical decision making. Um, another project uh, that we've been working on is related to the sexual health of female partners of prostate cancer patients. So um, this is the preliminary data which we presented at the SMSNA 2019 meeting where we use data from online health communities to look at um, what female partners of prostate cancer patients were discussing. And we identified some key themes where there was a lot of grief over loss of intimacy, practical adjustments that they were making for sex, feelings of isolation, emotional stress. And this led us to a grant project which we're currently working on with a DOD Idea Development Award, looking in more detail at the impact of prostate cancer therapy on sexual quality of life of couples. So we're leveraging some of the information and the participants from these online networks to develop um, more tools to address unmet needs for the partners of prostate cancer patients to promote better sexual health for the couple. Um, and another project that we're working on through a PCF Challenge Award, uh, this one is led by Veda Geary at Thomas Jefferson, um, and I'm the co-PI. We are looking at how technology might be used to accelerate the implementation of germline evaluation for prostate cancer. So definitely in recent years, it's come to light that um, more prostate cancer has underlying germline mutations than was previously recognized, but there's a lot of difficulty in um, the implementation of uh, germline genetic evaluation in clinical practice. So uh, the first part of the grant is looking at this tool, which was um, originally created by Veda Geary and her team at Jefferson and has since been modified by our team as part of this grant. But this is an app that is meant for healthcare providers. And um, there's two different functions. 
One function is to help determine who meets criteria for germline testing. And the second function is a series of educational modules with more information about all the different um, germline variants and what they mean and what different genetic results mean. So this is an example of the question intake part of this app. So um, you can answer a series of questions and there's a branching logic. So the minute your patient ans you answer something where the patient is eligible for germline testing, then it, it exits out and you don't need to answer more questions. So uh, with that in mind, question number one is, does your patient have metastatic prostate cancer? Because those patients are all recommended in the guidelines to have germline testing. So if you answer yes, you do not need to answer more questions about their family history or whether they have introductal pathology or anything else. But if you say no, and the patient has localized disease, it will take you through branching logic to determine um, if the patient has a different family history or histologic criteria who would be recommended to have germline testing. Um, and then the other portion of the app are these um, educational modules, which just have a lot of different information about um, what's in each of these genetic testing panels, what are the different kinds of results? Uh, what do you do with um, variants of uncertain significance? Um, things like that. What are some of the different genetic syndromes that prostate cancer may be a part of? So we're currently in the midst, um, as part of this grant, of doing usability testing of the app, um, which has been going well. We have a human factors expert and are doing um, you know, think aloud protocol with usability testing and cognitive mapping. Um, generally, people have found this tool to be easy to use. Um, they've used it in different ways in their workflow. And so once we complete this process, this will be um, hopefully publicly disseminated in the app store sometime later this year. Um, the other thing that we're working on in this grant is um, a web tool to provide pre-test genetic counseling. So once uh, we determine that a man is eligible for genetic counseling and consideration of germline testing, there's still a bottleneck because there's not enough genetic counselors in the United States. So many institutions don't have one, and even if they do, there might be long wait times. So we set out to determine could we replace the genetic counselor and give pre-test counseling through an online interactive web tool? So we are currently recruiting for a randomized trial that is comparing uh, the traditional genetic counseling for pre-test education versus the web tool. So this screenshot just shows one of the sample modules from the web tool. There's nine modules um, and they contain information in a text format and in a video format. And the participant has to answer some questions to show that they understood the material before they can progress through the modules. So um, this will be interesting to see if, if we can replace pretest genetic education with just an interactive web tool and that would save the time and effort of the um, limited number of genetic counselors for the back end and helping with interpretation of results and specifically management of families and cascade testing in the case of positive results. Uh, finally, some recommendations. So uh, this is a statement that we came up with through the European Association of Urology regarding telemedicine and smart working and just some tips um, about, you know, keeping an adequate work area at home, trying to find surroundings that maintain confidentiality, um, you know, professional attire, good communication and enthusiasm for remote work, but also trying to maintain healthy habits. Um, to try to keep up productivity when you're um, instead of just sitting in front of the 
the desk doing telemedicine visits for 10 hours straight and not standing up at all. It can definitely be very stiffening. Um, so I actually just bought a bike desk. So I've been testing out doing some Zoom meetings while cycling. It was like $200 at Dick's, but We'll see if maybe, uh, you know, getting a little more emotion in there could be helpful instead of just like sitting for hours and hours. Um, another thought is just uh, our own communications with patients. This is a study that I worked on with my uh, dear friend and colleague, Aisha Langford, who has a PhD in health communications, where we found that um, patients who had a lower perceived quality of interaction with their healthcare provider were more likely to watch health related videos on YouTube. So, if we don't give our patients enough time to ask questions or provide them with good sources of information to look at after the visit, then it's more likely that they will go on these platforms and, and maybe be exposed to misinformative content. So, I think. You know, we have to make sure that we give time to answer the questions, but also provide our recommended sources of outside information for them to use. Um, and also just to play a role in dissemination. So I think it is important to create more online content and to be an active participant in social media to try to dilute out the information and to share more evidence-based information with, with patients and the general public. Um, in terms of research and, you know, as, uh, you know, academic clinicians, this is also very important um, for dissemination. So, this is, was published a few years ago in one of the journals. It was like a kind of a funny piece, but they called it the Kardashian Index. So this grid here, you can see social media presence is on the y-axis and scientific contribution is on the x-axis. So uh, you don't want to be in the top left uh, quadrant because that is a high social media presence without any scientific contribution. So that's the Kardashian section. Um, conversely, the, the lower right quadrant is uh, a brilliant scientist sitting in a bubble. So you can have a very high scientific contribution, but if the information doesn't get out there, then you're not having the maximal impact of your work. So the sweet spot is the upper right quadrant where you have high scientific contribution and high social media presence. Um, also important though to familiarize with the guidelines on social media use. There is actually three urology specific guidelines on best practices. So I recommend, especially for the students and residents, you know, before actively engaging to just review these guidelines. I, it's important not to post any confidential patient information, um, just to, you know, be courteous know your institutional policies on social media, et cetera. Most of this seems pretty self-explanatory, but I still see people post, you know, images from CT scan and they haven't blacked out the patient name and things like that. So it really is important to just go the extra mile. Um, and then in terms of trying to get more engagement, um, here are some data-driven tips. So we took all the tweets from one of the EAU meetings to see what was more successful. And we found that there was greater engagement when you included more description, mention other people, have a photo, and also when you engage with others. So particularly for social media, the purpose is to be social. So it shouldn't be just a one-way stream. It should be an interaction. Um, and so never too late, but I recommend, you know, being friendly and, and also parsimonious. Save, save the post for what matters and give a nice description that, that draws people in. So in conclusion, there's definitely a substantial use of digital technology 
in all different facets of urology. Certainly, we've seen a lot of benefit for clinical care. Personally, I really enjoy telemedicine visits, so I'm delighted that it's uh, taken a more prominent role. Um, and I think that this, all the social networks and the online environment has a lot to potentially add for patient education, interprofessional communications and research, but um, definitely there are some caveats. So we need to ensure equity, quality, and tr try our best to prevent the spread of misinformation. So um, thank you to uh, my committees and to Declan Murphy, who initially got me started on Twitter, which caused, I guess, somewhat of a career pivot um, back in 2012, and uh, to the Prostate Cancer Foundation and Department of Defense for supporting our research. Thank you. Thanks, Stacy. That was a uh, tour de force presentation on, on digital health. Uh, so one of the things that um, I wanted to get your thoughts on, these days I, I'll tell the residents, so your paper really got a lot of likes or, or uh, retweets on Twitter. And oftentimes I think the residents are more so uh, on Instagram now. So do you see that kind of generational gap coming into effect at some point where uh, everything will transition over to another social media platform? Um, I mean, I use a lot of Instagram too, and I think it is a great platform. I think figuring out how to make um, salient urology content on different networks is going to be a challenge. But yes, I think certainly, you know, and if, it, if, you know, if you're trying to use it to discuss health conditions, thinking about who is the demographic of your audience could really determine where you go. Um, I just had a call yesterday with um, a sexual medicine specialist from a different part of the country who was getting into social media and asking for some tips. And, you know, I think, I think actually TikTok would be great for the populations that she's trying to reach. Um, so I think it's just an important analysis of your audience um, because of the current demographics of the healthcare providers in our field. Um, it seems that Twitter is still most important for interprofessional communication. But um, yes, I think there will be more use of Instagram in the future among urologists and that networks like Instagram or TikTok may be important for reaching certain groups of patients. Um, in my particular case, not so much because um, that's not where most of the prostate cancer patients and their families are. So for studies where we're trying to do something patient facing, like right now we have a different study that I didn't show where we're doing sponsored ad campaign targeting prostate cancer patients. And for that one, we're using Facebook because that's the platform that that demographic would be more likely to use. Stacey, that was a great presentation. How are you doing? Um, you, you mentioned uh, sort of obliquely um, something that I know has come up here, certainly on the operations committee, um, sort of this issue of you know equity and, and ability to access information, particularly for example for you know older patients, you know probably like prostate cancer patients that you see, and you know I think it's pretty straightforward for our residents and trainees to sort of like you said you know pop onto whatever social media app of their choice you know for that day, but you know thoughts about um, uh, patients who are older, patients who might not have access to sort of the internet that we probably take for granted. Yeah, I mean, I think there's definitely a lot of challenges. Um, I mean, you know, I'm sure you've experienced it and I've experienced it where the patient is scheduled for telemedicine, but they just, you know, can't get on or don't know how to do it. Um, and there's been a few studies coming out just looking at the different demographic of patients who had telemedicine visits over these past few months compared to the same urology department a year ago showing certain groups who were just not really having access to care. So um, I think this is a work in progress. I'm not sure I have the solution to this problem, um, but it's something that we need to think about and try to make sure that 
we're still able to provide good care to everyone. I mean, on one hand, you know, um, having some patients doing the telemedicine visits does, you know, take them out of the clinic. So that leaves more opportunities for other patients who either don't have broadband or um, have difficulty with technology to come into the clinic. So, I mean, I think that it, it could still end up potentially being a net positive, um, particularly during some, a time like right now where like I'm trying to keep my in-person clinic very light. So I've been swaying as many people as possible to telemedicine instead, especially if they just need to, you know, review an MRI or something like that. Um, but then that leaves openings at the clinic for people who cannot or um, do the telemedicine for one reason or another. And then it's less crowded, so they have less risk of exposure by coming to my office because the other people did the telemedicine. So I don't know. Could, could we still use it as a net gain, hopefully? Stacy, hi, this is Cora. That was that was absolutely a great talk. Um, I I saw a documentary that I can't remember the name right now. All about how Instagram really targets people. They know what you're looking at, and they target them primarily for selling things. And I'm wondering that by using Instagram um, in urology and urology practices, if you found that you've been targeted in some way, or other people using Instagram uh, have been targeted by I don't know advertising or in some way. Well, for sure. And um, I think that's a big concern of some of our patients. So we were doing some qualitative work with patients about their perspectives about these online networks. And one concern that people had is that they, some did not want to go on to YouTube or Instagram or other networks and search for prostate cancer because then they got targeted Actually, a lot of them got targeted for ads for like incontinence products. So they really do look at what you're searching and use it. Um, as a frequent Instagram user myself, I can say the ads are extremely targeted. I mean, the ads that I get are for things like related to dogs or boxing or definitely things that I search and not necessarily on Instagram either. So they seem to have integrated search history from other networks as well. So I think, you know, the, the targeting can be good or bad. Um, it can be good because you can run a targeted ad and really reach people very precisely who you want to reach. So if you're using a tar a, an ad, um, that can be a great way to find a very specific population of people. I mean, they have us down to every little detail but that is scary for some people and not everyone wants to be targeted. The great documentary was done by the people from Silicon Valley. I can't remember the name of it now. I think everyone should watch it so, about how the kids are being targeted particularly, and it's, which is even more worrisome than, than this. But I think that you know, the, the people in Silicon Valley who invented this, they won't let their kids have iPhones. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, <laughs> it's a legitimate question. So for our project where we're using a sponsored ad campaign to um, raise awareness about, yeah, the social dilemma, social dilemma. exactly. I saw that one and it's, it's a pretty, you know, it's an eye opener. Um, I mean, but, you know, this, our, what our phone knows about us is pretty frightening. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it can be leverage for a good purpose. So we're using like extremely specific targeting to try to raise awareness about BRCA in men. And we can target very specific people, even, for example, people with breast cancer, we can target. And, you know, that information might be important for that group. So, you know, very targeted public health messaging that might have a greater impact, but it can also be used for commercial purposes or more nefarious purposes. Absolutely. I mean, I personally must say that sometimes I find about the latest data on Twitter. I mean, the latest press release or something before the, it comes out even on Twitter. So sometimes it can be very useful. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing how quickly people know stuff on there. So. <laughs> 
Stacy, briefly, because we're going to wrap up shortly. You had mentioned that you often direct people to other sources of information after telemed visits. Perhaps offline, you could send us a couple of links of where you send people for information, for example, on PSA screening, um, prostate cancer management, et cetera, some of your uh, top links. Yeah, yeah, sure. I'd be happy to share that. And I mean, just like very briefly, you know, the Urology Care Foundation has a lot of great patient materials about a variety of topics. The PCF has a patient guide for prostate cancer that's fantastic. They actually have several guides, but I send a lot of people there and they can register there and download the entire information. So, you know, there's definitely a lot of good places, but if, if we don't tell them where to go, then they will just go into this quagmire of, of uh, you know, I guess maybe cesspool is a better term where more stuff is bad than good. So I think it is something that we should try to be more proactive about Great, Stacy. Thanks so much. Um, you know your your paper with Ted that's been cited a th over a thousand times on biopsy. We didn't even get to that, but um, one of the things I'm looking forward to if I see you again on a, a Zoom is to see how the uh, the biking platform works for you. You know, Ted told me you, you should stand up. He has a standing uh, Zoom platform because he says when you Zoom when you're sitting down, it looks like you're slouching. So uh, between the bike and the standing, we'll see which one wins out. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care now.